where we're going to start, kick off. Um, and so I appreciate you being back as well. And um, looking forward to uh, uh, tonight and the remainder of the week. And I think it's been already enjoyable. The fellowship, the food was great. Whoever cooked that, I know it wasn't. <laughs> it was ordered, but uh, you did a phenomenal job picking it up tonight. And so what a blessing. And uh, it's been good for our family as well. And, and um, it's kind of, uh, you know, driving here in the rain and all that. But it's nice for us to have something to do in the evening. And, and uh, looking forward to uh, God uh, blessing us. And I know you didn't come to hear from me, but I'm glad that I get to be here and uh, present to you what the Lord's laid on my heart. And so tonight I want to spend a few minutes maybe sharing something that um, um, there will be some encouragement here. But I guess some people may even think, well, well, that didn't even seem that encouraging in the end. Uh, But it is because it's true. Um, And uh, whenever we hear the truth, sometimes, um, you know, Jesus said... um, uh, uh, that uh, the truth shall make you free, you know, and when we hear truth, it helps us, right? And not always what we want to hear, uh, but we need to hear it. Let me give you an example. Uh, here's a truth. Uh, uh, um, broccoli is better for you than um, gummy bears. That's a truth that some people may not like to hear, uh, but it it's does us good to know those kind of truths, right? And so, the same is true about the Word of God, but I think it will be. My, and my intention tonight is that the truth that is presented would be something that would be an encouragement to you because it might even help um, to explain some things that God's maybe done in your heart, your life um, through the years and and um, in, in ways or maybe something that will come up. Uh, but I want us to start here in Revelation chapter 21. Now, just to lay a little bit of foundation, this is not necessarily the Uh, the context of the message tonight, but when we get to Revelation 21, what has happened? Well, the next event on God's calendar is the rapture. We've been waiting for the rapture. Well, Paul even was waiting for the rapture all the way 2,000 years ago. We don't know. It's imminent, which means it could happen at any moment, and the rapture is God's calling away of his saints, right? And we'll sometimes say it this way, the calling away of the church and, uh, but, um, but the believers, those that are born-again believers, will be called away in the rapture. There'll be a seven-year tribulation period, which is God's judgment upon the earth, which is God's judgment upon Israel to prepare them for the things, the fulfillment of the covenants and prom- promises he made to them, and, uh, and so forth. And then following the tribulation period, there is a, uh, there is a millennial reign of Christ, and uh, that happens in chapter number 20 in um, Revelation. There's a thousand-year reign. We'll rule and reign with the Lord here on this earth. And then uh, there's a final judgment. And um, this is a judgment. Uh, well, it looks uh, look there in chapter number 20, verse 13. The Bible says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and uh, death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. This is what we call the great white throne judgment. This will be the final judgment of those that have rejected Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Uh, you and I, I believe, actually, personally, I believe we'll be there, but we'll be in the audience as witnesses. We won't be judged there. After all, if you're saved, your works, your sins were hung to an old rugged cross 2,000 years ago. You've been forgiven of those sins. But this is for, as he says there, the sea gave up the dead. These are those that have died without Jesus Christ, and they'll stand and give that final judgment. The Bible says in death and hell, um, we're cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And so do we find this, this final judgment, or so to speak, final judgment. And then we get to chapter 21. And really the promises of, uh, of the beginning promises of eternity, uh, New Jerusalem, and and all that, and I just give that uh, just by way of introduction. It's not necessarily the context of the message, and uh, but I do want to look here in chapter 21 and watch in verse number one. The Bible says, "And I saw." This is John speaking. He says, "I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, that's the one we're in right now, were passed away, and there was no more sea." And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. 
and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And then probably one of the most familiar verses, among Christians at least, I mean, we think about some major verses in the Bible, and we would say probably the, the most popular, I'm just guessing, the most popular verse, John 3, 16, even Many unsaved people have heard of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And many of us could quote that verse, but uh, here is another one that is a favorite, I think, oftentimes among Christians, and it because it speaks about the fulfillment and the promises of things to come, especially when we lose loved ones. I would guess most of us in here have lost somebody and... Um, uh, they have gone before us, they've gone to heaven, and um, if they're saved, they've gone to heaven, and, and we've been comforted with words in these next verses. And notice here, if you would, in verse number four, the Bible says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. By the way, I said just a moment ago there in chapter number 20, I believe that as believers, personally, I believe, and the Bible doesn't indicate this, so I'm just suggesting, I believe that we'll be witnesses to that great white throne judgment, and I think we will shed many tears as believers because we will see our loved ones that did not accept Christ as their Savior. We'll see those people that we failed to witness to and be judged at that final judgment with no opportunity anymore uh, to accept Christ because they rejected him in this lifetime. And I believe there will be many tears, but... But now the Bible says there is coming the day, there is coming the time when God shall wipe away all tears. And then he says, and there shall be no more death. Aren't you looking forward to that day where there's no more tears and no more death? Aren't you, aren't you longing for that day? And, and probably all of us, right, I said a moment ago, all of us have experience the loss of, of a loved one or somebody we've known, even the young people, you maybe somebody you know, or uh, even right now we're concerned about somebody that's getting ever so close uh, to the end of their life and death is, is knocking at their door. And we know even for ourselves that we are but, our life is but a vapor, right? James would say, and and it could be, it's here one moment and gone the next, and death is at our door. We know it's appointed unto men once to die, but after that, the judgment, or after this, the judgment. And so, so death, um, but one day there is coming a time when there will be no more death. Aren't you excited about that? Death has been a real part of life or human history going all the way back to Genesis in chapter 3. And death was not God's intention. Death is a result of, um, of man's sin. The Bible says, wherefore, and Paul would say it this way in Romans chapter 5, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, that one man is Adam, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. For death hath passed upon all men for all of, for all of sin, right? So we know it is, death is a result of, of man's sin. And, um, and, and, and ever since uh, Adam ate of the fruit of the tree, the Bible says in Genesis chapter number 2, verse 17, God placed Adam in the, the midst of the garden. He said, Thou mayest eat of all the trees of the garden, that, uh, but the tree in the midst thereof thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And uh, he began, as soon as he ate of that tree, and by the way, it wasn't an apple tree. The tree that he ate of is not here on this earth at the moment. Uh, it was whatever that fruit was is not here. He ate of it and it's been taken away. But anyways, so it will be brought back, by the way, in New Jerusalem. The tree of life will be brought back. But to, uh, anyway, so, so um, uh, here um, uh, death is a result of man disobeying God and it's passing upon all men. We, we're all appointed unto, men, uh, uh, un, uh, unto death. Uh, death is coming. It's lingering apart from the rapture. Um, but should the Lord tarry, every one of us in this room, uh, we can be sure of it, right? We, we, we be sure of two things, right? We're going to pay taxes and, uh, and death, right? Yeah, it's coming. And so we, we long for the day. We look forward. We're, we're encouraged by the promise that one day 
no more death. I mean, death um, creeped into our family this year in January, and, and uh, the very first week of January, my wife went to go take care of my mom. She was sick, and, and uh, she insisted uh, she's going to stay home, but she's been in hospitals her entire life, and, and she just said, you know what, I'm either going to die at home or I'm going to get better at home. I'm not going to the hospital. I'm not going to listen to the doctor. And so uh, my wife went out there and, and uh, took over the duties. I have two sisters. They had been sharing the duties, just keep an eye on my mom. And, and, uh, but anyways, uh, we wanted to kind of relieve them of that. My wife went out there and spent the week with her. And the very last day uh, my wife was there, uh, my mom uh, left this earth. And, um, and uh, it, was a, it was a heartbreaking time, obviously, uh, for all of us. I have five, there's five of us in my family. I have two brothers, two sisters, and... And it was heartbreaking, but it was also glorious because we know that as soon as she entered, uh, as soon as death crept her on her door, she entered into eternal life because she knew Christ as her Savior. And, but I'm looking forward to that day where there will be no more of that. No more of, 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 of hearing of death creeping at the door. And so he says there, there shall be no more death. Notice as he continues on, neither sorrow. Neither sorrow. Well, not only did death enter into the world by sin in Genesis chapter number 3, but also sorrow did as well. The sorrow is a result of man's sin. And it's a very real part of our lives, uh, our entire life, your entire life, my entire life. We've been acquainted with death and we've been acquainted with sorrow. Uh, sorrow, if you'll remember, if you know your Bibles in Genesis chapter number 3, and we don't have time to read all this, but Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 16, because Adam and Eve had eaten of the fruit, God tells Eve, he says, uh, because, you, uh, because you took of the fruit and, and did all that, and you listened to the serpent, he says, and in childbearing, you, sh you shall b bear children in sorrow. There'll be sorrow. And then verse number 17, he tells Adam, he says, because you listened to uh, your, the wife and ate of the fruit and did all that. And when you're, um, the work that you do, the toil, it will be in toil and sorrow you shall do that work. And, and so anyway, sorrow is a real part of this life. Um, by the way, um, <clears throat> some people would rather go through life just happy and dumb. Um, but you know, sorrow is a result of, uh, of knowledge, the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes. Solomon said that uh, with knowledge cometh sorrow. Some people would rather be ignorant and happy, uh, but uh, the more you know, and we're not talking about uh, in the books, the more you know, the more sorrow you will have. Uh, uh, what, do you, what do you mean? I mean, the more you know about the Word of God and what what God has done for man and what man has rebelled against God. And then when you watch the news and you see things on the news, it'll, it'll bring sorrow to your hearts. And by the way, you think about Jesus Christ, all knowledge is given to him, right? He is all omniscient or all-knowing. And the Bible says he was acquainted with Greece. And the Bible says he was a man of sorrows. Yeah, yeah. As he looked upon this world and the wickedness of this world, he could see the, the heartache and, and the toil and all that, and it brought sorrow to him. And, but sorrow is a real part of life. And, um, but one day, no more sorrow, praise God. One day, God shall wipe away all tears and, um, and no more death. There'll be no more sorrow. He goes on, he says, nor crying. Now, listen. In the room tonight, undoubtedly, some of you are more criers than others of us. Now, I'm not much of a quiet crier, but there has been a few times that I have cried. And uh, my wife and uh, my mom would have said the same thing if she was still here. Uh, they, they, they usually accuse me of having no heart because I don't cry enough or I'm not sad enough. And so they say, you're heartless. And and uh, that is true, by the way. One time I was getting a physical when I was in high school, and the nurse was trying to find my heartbeat with that little thing, you know, the stethoscope or whatever it is. And she was going, hmm. She went, hmm. And I went, what? She said, I can't find your heartbeat. And I said, I'm pretty sure it's there. I'm pretty sure it's there. She said, yeah, I think so. And so anyway, so, uh, but some, some are more subject to crying than others. But all of us have had times that will bring tears to our eyes. But the day is coming when there will be no more crying, amen? By the way, crying, uh, the pain, he goes on, he says, the next thing, neither, neither uh, be there any more pain, 
uh, pain and crying are both the result, just like sorrow and death, they're a result of sin. And we don't see we don't see in Genesis chapter number three crying, but um, and we don't even see it in Genesis four. But what you do see is great pain in Genesis chapter number four, and undoubtedly there was some crying going on. You say, what happened in Genesis chapter number four? Well, that's where Cain, the firstborn of Adam and Eve, killed his brother Abel. So we see pain there, but imagine Adam and Eve, their own children. Their own children, one of their own, their firstborn son murdering their secondborn son. And and knowing that it was a result of them eating the tree back when they did, or eating that fruit of the tree. And so, so there has been sorrow and crying and pain ever since then. But but praise God, aren't you glad that one day, none, no more of that? Come on now, aren't you glad? I mean, I'm looking forward to that day. No more of these things. And, and he tells us, he says, for, notice the rest of the verse, he says, for the former things are passed away. And, and that, that's an encouragement to every single believer. He says, and, and he that sat upon the throne, that's Jesus Christ, by the way, said, uh, he said, behold, I make, would you say the next word with me? All things new. He says, um, there'll be no more of these things, these heartaches, as a, the, the things that are a result of sin in this world that came upon the man that you, you and I have had to be acquainted with our entire lives. We, we don't even know a life, you know, the, the way God intended it and, and when he created Adam and Eve was not the way things turned out when Adam and Eve had sinned, but you and I were born under the curse of sin, and we've been well acquainted with these things, but the day is coming when there'll be no more of these things, and we can almost not even fathom it. I mean, we'll say amen, we're looking forward to it, but, um, but we, we, can't even, we can't even fathom what it might be like to have no more pain or sorrow, but, but praise God, we have that promise that one day it's coming. But the Bible goes on from there, and he says there in verse number five, he says, Jesus will also say, you understand that I will make all things all things will be new. I'm glad that all the bad things will be made new. I'm glad that the, uh, the bad in this world will be done away with, and, and I'm glad that the, the death will be replaced with eternal life, and I'm glad that uh, sorrow will be replaced with eternal joy, and I'm glad that, that uh, crying will be replaced with, with eternal rejoicing, and I'm glad that... Um, uh, that pain will be re- re- restored with the eternal bliss of health and all those things. That, that, and, and so I'm glad of that, but you understand that everything will be made new, not just the bad things. So what do you, what do you mean by that? Um, you understand that even the things that we enjoy in this world right now, the good things, are but temporal because what's eternal is so much better. All right, go over your Bibles and follow with me, if you would, a little bit. We'll do a little bit of uh, examining, uh, examining the Scriptures. But 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 tonight, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Most of us are uh, familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's what we call the love chapter. And uh, we're not going to look at the love part here, but that's, that's the context of the chapter. And you think uh, uh, just by way of background and understanding of the Scriptures, um, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, a church that is divided, they're, they're bickering, they're fighting, they're uh, all kinds of problems in the church. I mean, it starts off with divisions in chapter number one, and, and uh, you got divisions in chapter number three, they're complaining, they're, they're, there's schisms going on, or divisions in the church, and lawsuits going on, there's open sin in the church, and chapter number five, I mean, all these things, and, and uh, anyway, so you get to chapter number 13, and and uh, Paul, is start, he says, look, uh, uh, love is what's most important. You have love and uh, lo- God-like love, not, not like worldly love, but God-like love. And uh, all these other things don't mean anything. I mean, love uh, will cover a multitude of sins, the Bible tells us. And so, so anyways, um, he's talking about that. And I want us to pick up in verse number 9. After he's talking about love, and in the context there, he says, For we know in part... We, and we prophesy in part, 
But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So, um, so Paul, in the middle of this, talking about love, he gives 15 principles about what charity it's called here in our Bibles. Charity is benevolence or agape love. And uh, he gives 15 principles about agape love. He starts there in verse number, um, uh, you know, in chapter 13 and verse number 4. He says, charity suffereth long. And that's the first thing. He says, it's kind. It envies not. And he goes on this list of 15 things. And he finishes off. And he says, charity never faileth. And he, he, then he stops there. And he kind of seems to shift gears. And he says, um, he says um, you know, now, now we know in part but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. Now, I've heard this scripture mutilated, and, and uh, I'm not even going to get into that. And I disagree with a lot of the even Baptist brethren that take an approach that what the perfect is, that which has come is the scriptures. I don't think that's what it's talking about at all. When you look at the context here, it's clearly talking about when we get up there, when we are face to face is the word he's going to use there in verse number 12. And so he says, look, there is that which is now, and then there's a then. And, and the then is going to, when we get to the then, the things that are now are temporal, but the then is eternal. And as he continues on, he says, he gives an example. He says, verse number 11, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And he's using that as an analogy. He says, look. Uh, we know in part, and by the way, uh, just think about a young child. If you've raised children, or you yourself, I mean, as you've gotten older, you've learned more things, you've learned more about the truths of the world, and, and uh, your children are learning that, and they don't, know, they don't fully understand. I mean, a little kid doesn't understand that if they put their fingers on the burner, uh, they're going to get burned. I mean, you have to teach them that. They don't see the truths until you start teaching them that. And, uh, and so anyway, um, you gain knowledge. And so he uses that as an analogy. He says it's the same way as you and I as believers right now. We're only, we're only seeing things in part. But one day, we're going to see the fullness of things. We shall know him, for we shall see him face to face. He'll go on in chapter 15 to say. But notice here, he says in verse 12, and watch this. Watch what he says. He says, for now, now we see through a glass darkly. All right, so what's now? Well, in case you don't know, you and I are living in the now. This is where we're at. Um, We're not living yesterday. We're not living tomorrow. I mean, for Paul, it was 2,000 years ago. The now was for him, but I wasn't even alive then, and he's not alive now. The now that he's talking about is now. We're in the now right now, right? Wow, this is what I came to church to learn, Uh, just to be reminded of it. And he says, says, you understand that that, um, now, you and I, we see through a glass darkly. And and, uh, the glass here is, you just picture it. I mean, you can see, you can see what's to come. And and we, I mean, we even just read about a little bit about what's to come, about no more death, no more sorrow, and all those things. Uh, But we can see it, and we can praise God for it. But we, we still can't fully comprehend what that's really going to be like because we've never experienced that. We, you've never been in a world that had no more death. But, but I mean, we can praise God. We're looking forward to that. What if, and, or, or the other pictures, if you continued reading there in, in uh, Revelation chapter 21 and 22, you start to see uh, what, ha- what New Jerusalem is going to be like. I mean, one of the pictures there is that the, the gates are, as, are gates of what, somebody? Gates of pearl, but not pearls, pearl. Okay, if you've ever seen a pearl, they're usually pretty small, and you can't walk through one of those. But in heaven, the gates are a pearl. Each gate is a pearl, not pearls. It's a pearl. You ever seen a pearl that big? I've never seen an oyster that big. I love oysters. I would love to have an oyster that big. Uh, another example, or another picture of what heaven's going to be like, New Jerusalem, is going to also have streets that are paved with gold. Streets that are paved with gold. But not just gold. The gold is so pure that the Bible says it's transparent. 
You see, when you're looking at your gold watch or your, your gold ring or whatever, and you see it's got that golden color, right? That what we call it gold, it's got that yellow color. What you're actually seeing is the impurities that are in the gold. But if you purified gold perfectly pure gold, it would be transparent. And you realize that the streets in heaven are going to be paved with gold. Here on this earth, we paved the streets with asphalt. Does anybody know why we paved the streets with asphalt? Because it's cheap. It's durable and it's cheap. I've never seen, I mean, I've seen cobble streets, you know, old-fashioned cobble streets. I've seen brick streets. I think I saw one around here yesterday or something. We drove through an intersection. And I went, oh, that's like bricks or so I think it was here, somewhere close by. Anyways, uh, I've seen that, but I, I've yet, I've never seen, I've never seen a city decide, you know, let's go ahead and pave the streets with gold. But in heaven, you, we do it with asphalt because it's cheap. You know why God does it in heaven? Because it's cheap. Compared to, compared to what he's got, I mean, that's, that's the cheap material up there, not only gold, but pure gold. And uh, I don't know if that's why, but, you know, anyway, so, so we, can't, we can kind of picture that, but we can't fully picture that is what I'm saying because we've never experienced the things that are going to happen in heaven. But he says, now, now we see through a glass darkly, but then, he says in verse number 12, but then face to face, all right? So now we see through a glass darkly, but... But the day is coming, if you know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior, you will stand before him face to face, and ye shall know him, for ye shall, ye, ye, you shall know him as he is, because ye shall be like him, right? And, and how was he? Well, he was without sin. You, you one day are going to have the, the, you don't know what that's like on this earth. You, you and I are loaded with sin. I mean, we, we've, been, we've been acquainted with sin our entire life. We struggle not to sin, and, and, uh, and thank God for Jesus is sacrifice, otherwise we'd have no hope. And if you're here living in your sin, Jesus died for you. So you wouldn't have to pay for your sin. And, but but uh, one day, I'm going to stand before him and know him face to face, and I will, I will no longer be, but I will be free from ever sinning again. I'm looking forward to that day. I will, I will know things. You know, we'll talk about this way. You know, sometimes uh, Christians will say, you know, the ladies will say something like, when I'm, when I die and get to heaven, I'm going to get in line and wait, and I'm going to ask Eve why she ate of that fruit, you know, whatever. And then, then the guys are like, uh, you know, when I get in, get to heaven, I want to, I want to ask Noah uh, why, you know, how long, whatever, uh, how how things were when he was building the ark, or ask Moses this, or you're not going to ask anybody anything in heaven, just so, just so we can clarify. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that, but you understand all you're going to want to do is get close to Jesus. And by the way, you won't need to ask because you'll have knowledge then. You shall know. You, right now, you see through a glass darkly, but then you won't see through the glass darkly. You'll see through the glass clearly. And uh, it'll be different face to face. He says, um, and now, notice as he continues, he says, now I know in part, but then I shall I know even as also I am known. I'll know him. He'll know me. How does he know me? He knows me without sin because my sin's under the cross. He knows me without sin because it's under the blood. And, and I'll know him and we'll have perfect knowledge as I was referring to a moment ago. He says, he says so, so here's the point is Paul says, you understand that, it, you, you know, and he was saying it 2,000 years ago, but it's the same for us. Right now, we see things one way, but there's coming a day for believers anyway. For the unbelievers, you're going to perish in eternity in the lake of fire. We read about that in Revelation chapter number 20. But for the believer, uh, now you see through the glass darkly, but then everything's going to be, well, new, different. It'll be different. There's a big difference between now and then. And I'm glad there is. I mean, because in the then, there's no more death. There's neither sorrow, no crying. There's no more pain. None of these things are going to be, it's all, it's all made new. Aren't you glad? I know I've asked you a couple times, but aren't you glad? But you understand that all things means, well, it means all things. You understand that, as I said a moment ago, it's not just the bad things. There's, there are some good things in this world. Let me put it this way. 
God blesses his people in this world, doesn't he? We get some blessings. How many of you feel like, uh, you don't need to raise your hand, just nod your head or say amen or something, roll your eyes, whatever. But, but how many of you, you say, well, I've been, I've been blessed. God's blessed me. Beyond salvation, I mean, obviously salvation, but beyond that, God, God's done some things for me. He's blessed me. And uh, you understand that, um, that even your blessings in this world are, well, they're just temporary. Now, there, now, hold on a second. There are, there are a couple blessings that we receive in this world that will go into eternity. First of all, our salvation. That's eternal. That's an eternal blessing. I mean, the Bible doesn't say salvation is a blessing, but it is a blessing, and we know it's eternal, right? So that's, that's one blessing that's eternal. Uh, another blessing that is eternal is the Word of God. The Word of God is eternal, and uh, it will never end. But you understand most of the blessings that you and I have in this life are just to help us get through life. I mean, probably the greatest blessing other than some of those eternal blessings like salvation and uh, the word of God, the, probably the greatest blessing, uh, I, the, my greatest blessing, and I would hope you would agree in your life, the greatest blessing I, I have is my wife. The Bible says, uh, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. And I found, I, I'm glad that uh, God brought me a godly wife. I could not imagine having life without her. She is the greatest blessing to me, apart from salvation and those things eternal, the word of God. She is the greatest blessing in my life. But you understand that, um, that my marriage with her is only temporal. It's, it's a lifetime appointment. It's until death do us part, but it's only going to last in this life. You remember Matthew chapter number 19, the Pharisees come to him. The lawyers say, uh, is it okay to put away your wife for any cause or any purpose? And Jesus went on, he explained in Matthew, he said, you understand the angels aren't given to marriage in heaven. In, in eternity, you're not going to be married in heaven. I'm, I'm going to have a mansion, she's going to have a mansion. I believe personally, the Bible doesn't say this, but I believe personally I do think it indicates this with David and his son. I believe I'll know that she was my wife, and she'll know I was her husband, but in heaven we won't be given in marriage. Are we okay? We got this? I mean, we're not going to still be married. Death will do us part, but, but for this life, she is the greatest blessing I have, and I'm glad. But, but even that blessing will be made new. I'll be married. We'll be married to the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, that's weird. That's because it's a different, it's a spiritual thing, right? Something, this is a picture of my relationship with Jesus Christ eternal, eternally. And that's why this is so important because it pictures the relationship of Christ with his church, his believers, right? We okay, we got that? Uh, we don't have time to get all the details there. Uh, but even that's, you know, another blessing, a, a second blessing with my, my children. They're, they're a great blessing in my, but you know, I, I only... I, I have a responsibility I to, to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But even that blessing's temporal. Some of you have possibly raised your children. They're no longer in your home. They've married, and I believe that's what separates the children from their parents. The Bible says, wherefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife? And I believe that's what relinquishes uh, the, the leadership of a father and mother over their child is when they get married and and uh, so anyways, one day they'll no longer be under my jurisdiction. I think they'll still be a blessing. So it's a temporal blessing that I get to raise them and lead them, and I need to good, be a good steward of that blessing right now. But one day it's going to end, right? And then the real blessing comes, right? If you, some, I don't know if some of you, the real blessing, because you didn't kill your kids, you get grandkids, right? And uh, the real blessing comes, and that's what I've heard, and uh, and uh, anyway, so, so we get blessings like that, but even those blessings are temporal. They'll be made new one day. You say, you say I'm just not sure I'm getting it. You understand that the, God, the things that God's blessed you with, here's the point, the things that God's blessed you with are meant, different ones for different reasons, meant to get you from one point to another point in your life. It might be, like I said with marriage, it's supposed to get you all the way to the end point of life. Do you understand that the blessings are just temporal? That they're not meant to last forever. I mean, other than salvation and all that. You say, I'm not sure this is helping me. I'm not sure 
I'm not sure I can. Well, let me, let me give you an example of this. Look over in your Bibles in 1 first, first Kings chapter 17 real quick. I'll show you an example of this. We could point out many, many different examples of this throughout Scripture. Uh, but we'll use this one right here. So 1 Kings chapter number 17. The Bible says, and I'll give you time to turn there. I'll just reading here. 1 Kings chapter 17. And Elisha, or Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word, and the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, verse number 3, here we go, 1 Kings chapter number 17, verse 3 says, Get thee hence, so God's telling Elijah, get thee hence, turn thee eastward, and hide thyself with the, by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. So God is going to judge the land, because the land of Israel, because Ahab is a wicked king who has turned the hearts of the people against God, and God's going to judge them. And aren't you glad that God still provides for his children in spite of judgment? So here, Elijah, he's in the midst of God judging, and God doesn't remove him from that, but God provides for him in the midst of that. So he tells Elijah, he says, Elijah, and uh, he says, um, now I'm going to judge Israel. He doesn't say that right there, but... But in, he's judging Israel. He says, uh, but I want you to go by this brook, the brook Cherith. And I want you to go there. And then watch what he says, verse number 4. 1 Kings 17, verse 4, he says, And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. Why is that important? Because God's judgment was that he's not going to bring dew nor rain for until he says otherwise. It's actually going to turn out to be three years without dew or rain. So it's going to be important if God's going to provide for Elijah that he's got a place to drink. And if you want to put, put it this way, and I see it this way, this is God blessing Elijah while he's judging Israel. Do you agree with me? God's going to bless him. He's going to give him the brook to drink thereof. And, and he says, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Now that's a whole nother picture. An amazing thing that God's going to use, by the way, an unclean animal to the children of Israel to bring food to one of his servants. I, and ravens are scavengers. Uh, the place where Elijah, the brook that he's at, would have probably been in the flight path from Jezebel. Jezebel's the wife of Ahab. And uh, she put out tables for the uh, priest of the um, uh, the uh, the priest of the groves, she was worshiping false idols and all that. She put out, they ate from her tables. And I want, you just kind of wonder, did these ravens come and snatch the very food that was meant for the pagans and bring it to the man of God out there in the wilderness? I think so. But either way, God takes him out there and he says, look, I'm going to, I'm going to judge Israel for this. I'm going to judge Ahab's house, but I'm going to provide blessing for you. I'm going to give you food and water. They'll be thirsty, but you won't be. We all okay? It's a blessing of God. But watch what happens. The Bible says, So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan, and the ravens brought him bread and fish in the morning and bread and fish in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook, it what? Dried up. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Isn't the brook, didn't we all agree, the brook is the place of God's blessing. The water going through the brook is providing for Elijah. It's, it's giving him provision. It's giving, it's quenching his thirst. It is the blessing of God. But you see there, the Bible says that after a while, the brook, the thing that was supposed to be blessing Elijah would be dried up. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. God is going to continue to provide for Elijah and take him from the brook Cherith and take him to the house of Zarephath and bless him there. If you know your Bible, that's what's going to happen next. I understand, but a totally different blessing. See, one, one blessing dried up and God said, all right, time for the next one. You see, because blessings are only meant to get us from one place to another. You say, well, okay, what's this got to do with me? How is this being an encouragement to me? Because cause here's the point tonight that I want to make with you. is far, far too often. I've been a pastor for 16 years, and I've seen it many times. I've, I've, I've encountered it in my own life where I've got to be careful to check myself. 
I've seen way too many times where Christians find themselves were being blessed of God by something, and all of a sudden the brook dries up. The blessing that was from God is no longer a blessing anymore. And what happens if we're not careful, if we don't know the truth, that blessings are only meant to get us to a certain place. Praise God, some blessings will take us the rest of our life. But blessings are never promised to last forever, is the point. God can make a blessing last until the day I die, but he might take a, di a different one away. The brook might dry up in a different one. You say, like, what are you talking about? I mean, I've had people that come to me. They say, Pastor, would you be praying? I get this job. I, I really could use this job and, and, and whatever. We'll be praying, and God will give them the job. And, and praise God, they're happy in that job. God, God's providing for them there. The brook's coming in, and then all of a sudden, a pandemic hits, and they get laid off. And they go, what happened? I thought, God, would, why would God do that to me? Why would that happen? Why would it? might just be that that brook it was time for it to dry up and god has another blessing for you and if we're not careful when the brook dries up we'll get mad at god and what it shows us is the problem is that we were worshiping the blessing and not the blesser see that's the danger there we'll get so attached to the blessing that we forget that the blesser is the one that gave us the blessing. The blessing was only meant to get us to a certain point in our life or wherever God determined, hopefully the rest of our life, but sometimes the brook dries up and that God, the blesser, is still God the blesser, whether the blessing has dried up or not. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, look, last night we had a preacher here a missionary who spent his life giving his life to serve the Lord. And I'm only bringing him up because he was here yesterday. I met him for the first time, like many of you. And you know, you know what he was doing here? He was bringing his daughter some things that belonged to her mother who just passed away. He's served the Lord since the, the 70s. He's been a missionary to military families around the world, Spain, Japan, uh, 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 Germany for a couple years and his wife contracted cancer and God took away from that man, that dear man that loved God and served God, took away the blessing just recently from him. But you know what he wasn't doing yesterday? Sulking in it, mad at God. You know what he was doing? He was here worshiping with us. He was here praising God still. Uh, no doubt. No, I didn't ask him. I didn't. I didn't. I mean, he shared. He just shared that his wife just passed away. We didn't talk about it in any great length, but but I know that he's got to be hurting. He's probably very sad that that blessing is gone. The, probably the greatest blessing in his life. If he if he had a relationship with his wife like I do with my wife, he's probably heartbroken. But he still knows the blesser, and he's still worshiping the blesser in spite of the blessing being dried up. You understand what I'm saying now? The blessing, can go, the blessing might go away, but the blesser is the one that gave it to him in the first place. And so he's still here worshiping the blessing. I mean, all across America, there are people not in church anymore that used to be in church, but a blessing, a brook dried up, and they got mad at God. The one that gave them the brook in the first place, they got mad at God, and they're bitter, they're angry. I mean, there might be people in church tonight, I don't know, and you're here but you've been mad at God for a long time because some brook years ago dried up and you go, I don't, I don't know why God ever did that to me. Wait a minute. God gave you the brook in the first place. And God wants to give you more brooks. He wants to bless you more, but he wants you to worship the bless. See, again, I say it this way. If we're not careful, what we'll do is we'll worship the blessing and appreciate the blesser. When we're supposed to worship the blesser and appreciate the blessing. See, the blesser is eternal. Eternal, The blessing is temporal. I'll give you one last one for an example. 1982, I believe it's 1982. 1982, October, uh, my father-in-law put his family. My wife was just four years old at the time. She had a little brother, a little sister, and uh, her mom and and uh, a whole school, a whole little, you know, small church, just a just planted church, a couple years old, and 
and uh, that, that church, they would, they would bust the kids or ban the kids back in the early 80s, ban them a, an hour and a half away to another church across the valley in central California, and uh, every single day, and they would go there, they had a Christian school at the other church, and, and so uh, my father-in-law would put, uh, they would put kids on the van from the church, and they would ship them across the town, if you want to put it that way, it's across the valley, not really town at all, and, uh, and uh, ship them away, and, and they would go to Christian school all day, and then come home, and all that, well, one day on a Friday, October 1982, my father-in-law stayed back that day, and my, my, my wife's mother uh, was the driver that day, and she got in the van, and six, and I'm, I'm sorry, uh, uh, 11 kids there got in the van, and, and uh, they began to make their journey across uh, the 198 in Central California. And about halfway, halfway there that morning, uh, October morning, 1982, about halfway there, in the oncoming lanes across the highway, a semi-truck driver started dozing off. And he snapped to just in time to see a car that had started to come out to the highway but stalled out. And so that semi-truck driver immediately swerved to miss the car that had stalled out. And when he did that, he lost control of the semi-truck, which he was going over the speed limit. He hopped across the median and hit head-on that van that was carrying that school group. There's my mother-in-law driving and my wife, just four years old. Back then, there was no seatbelts, you know, no seatbelt laws. So Charity was sitting there on the lap of a 16-year-old boy, all those kids in there, her little brother and sister. And immediately when that happened, everybody in that van perished. It's, well, one other girl made it for a little while and perished at the hospital and then, and then little four-year-old girl sitting on a 16-year-old's lap got one little scratch and everybody else in that van died immediately my wife lost her mom she lost her little brother she lost her little sister her dad who was a young pastor at the time lost his entire family except for one daughter he all of a sudden went from a family of five to being a single dad pastoring a church who also had church members that had just lost their kids now he's got to pastor them and, you know, it would have been very easy for him to just go, I can't believe God would allow that to happen. Do you know what he didn't do? He didn't do that. He kept pastoring that church for almost a year after that, kept pastoring those people and loving them. Eventually, God would lead him out of there. Or he felt the need to resign the church, and he traveled for a while in evangelism. Uh, God would give him another wife. He's been married for many years now. Give him another son another daughter so charity has another brother and sister and and all that you know he's just still faithfully serving you know why but it would have been very very easy for him to get mad at the blesser because the blessing dried up but he didn't a few years ago actually he wrote a book about it and now he's encouraging other believers he's traveled across the country and and um uh, uh, up at north valley publications dr jack trever and them they published his book for him and and he's traveled around the country being a blessing to churches and, and other people. But he, he's being a blessing because he learned about the blesser that was more important than the blessing. Look, and I'm just trying to encourage you tonight. Say, um, I'm not sure this truth is that all that helpful to me. I hope it's an encouragement because maybe you're going through something where you've been holding on to something against God because a blessing dried up a long time ago. And you need to just get back to God and just say, Lord, I'm sorry. I want to worship the blesser. But it might be some of you say, no, it's not happened to me. Well, it will. You'll have blessings dry up. It may not be as tragic as hurt, but there'll be something. Our heads are bowed, our eyes closed tonight. I think you got the point. But I want Christian, is there something God might be speaking to your heart about? Has there been something in your life that um, God has allowed to happen? And, and maybe you say, I don't, I don't know why that would happen. I don't know why God would allow that to happen. And can I just make a suggestion? It might have been that God just says, look, that's, that's all the time for that blessing. And tonight, maybe you just need to come and just say, Lord, uh, help, me to, help me to worship the blesser, not the blessing.
Let me appreciate the blessing, but worship the blesser. Father, we thank you for the word of God. I pray that you would help us as you see fit. Lord, I've spoken the truth you've laid on my heart, but unless your Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts, and unless we respond, it means nothing. So, Lord, I pray it would not be in vain. May we be doers of the word, not hearers only. I pray that you now bless th this time of invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The piano begins to play. If you need to come tonight, maybe there's something that you say, God, why? Why? Maybe tonight God's giving you that answer. It was just a blessing, just for a while. Maybe you have some blessings that you need to appreciate more. Maybe there's some blessings, Christian, in your life that you have put too much priority over. And you worship them above the blesser. That's you tonight. If God's leading in your heart, would you come? Maybe there's somebody here tonight, you say, Pastor Cisco, I'm not sure if I were to die today, I'm not 100% sure I'd go to heaven. Listen, would you come? Um, we'll have somebody privately show you from the Bible how you can know for sure that you're on your way to heaven. If that's you tonight, we want, we want you to be saved. That's the primary reason this church exists is so that people will know they have an eternal home in heaven. If that's you, if you say, on my way home, I'm not sure if I would have been in that accident if I were go to heaven. We want you to know that. Would you come right now? Just meet me right up front. Just say, just give my attention. We'll have somebody privately show you from the Bible how to be saved. Man, that was good. <clears throat> it was good. It uh, just a subtle reminder from God's word. It's helpful, but that's why we do these meetings, Amen. That's why we do them. I'm going to ask you to stand one more time tonight, and uh, we're going to sing um, one time through page four two zero. It is no secret. Page 420, it is no secret. Uh, while you're turning there, I just want to remind you, dinner, 6 o'clock tomorrow, service right after, okay? 420, lift your voices as we sing. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for us. Dismissed.